Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Ling Ha. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> we are going to blitz through your life because we only have one hour and there is so much to cover and so many stories you're a part of that you've also heard that I think our listeners will love. And I always start by going to the very beginning. Mm. And I learned very quickly, you're the eldest of seven kids. You've moved around because your dad's in the military 19 times before you were 10. And I learned that your family is compared to the Kennedys. What does it mean to be part of the Lower Grads clan? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure it's truly often, but it's probably not for all the best qualities of the Kennedys, quite frankly. Yeah. Big Catholic family, very athletic, rambunctious. Yeah. We sort of grew up in a house of cowboys where we were all, I would say we were a tribe. Yeah. Uh, in a way, we were like a big Asian family in that there were a lot of expectations around showing up, around duty, around taking care of each other. Sometimes my mother would say, I will always love you, but I don't like you very much right now. So could you please change your behavior? And she was a myth maker. And I think that that was a really big part of what it meant to grow up with actually not very much money, moving around so not very much stability, always having to make new friends but knowing that you were part of something where you were safe. And even though you had seven siblings, your dad wanted to adopt from an orphanage as well? He and did. Didn't that impact the way you saw the world and your role in it? In my family, there was always room for more. Always room for more and for difference. Mm -hmm. My parents, at a time when communities tended to be very homogenous, my parents welcomed everyone and that was just a part of the family ethos and as a result which is interesting that even though we were this big family that was chaotic without a lot of money we were also the family that everybody wanted to come hang out with the cool ones <laughs> the fun ones i don't know if we were cool but we were fun what were some of the fun things that you were doing we just laughed all the time in so many ways in part my brothers were like Mike. Mike is a very unedited. Sounds larger than life. He's very, la <laughs> he's very larger than life. In a way, they all were bigger. Mike particularly. And even today, you can't take yourself very seriously because yeah. no matter what you quote unquote do in the world, you're reminded of who you were when you were 12 years old. You end up going to study foreign affairs and also economics at University of Virginia. And I saw your valedictory address earlier this year, and you actually said that when you graduated, I quote, you were excited, idealistic, and had dreams in your head of changing the world and didn't have a clue how to start. My question then became, why was it the first thing you did was to go to Chase Manhattan Bank of all places? Fair question. Very fair question. But I think I really wanted to change the world when I was six. So my whole life. But I also had the realities of so many young people today Friends, my family without very many economic resources, immigrant mentality. I was actually going to be an English major, and my dad sort of took me aside to say, you'll never be able to support yourself. You have to study economics, which was not in my game plan. And then it was also not in my game plan to go into banking. I wanted to take a year because I had spent so much of my time working to pay my way through college. And then I happened into this crazy job interview that took foreign affairs economics resumes. And when the man asked me why I wanted to be a banker, as someone who still can't lie, I told him the truth, which is that my parents made me do the interview process and that I really didn't want to be a banker. But here I was fulfilling the duty. And he told me how sad that was because people who got that job would be in 40 countries in the next three years. And I literally said, please, can we start this interview again? For whatever reason, he said, okay, I left, I left the room. I came back in, I reintroduced myself. He asked me, tell me, Jacqueline, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. I got the job. And that was in 1983 during a financial crisis. For the next year, I learned incredible tools of the trade. I learned how economies work. I actually spent a lot of time, not only in places like Brazil and Peru, Colombia, but here in Malaysia in 1984 or 85, I worked in KL. I wasn't even born. <laughs> I meet all these young people today and I think, I remember your country before you were born when 
the systems were so entirely different. And it's been so thrilling to me actually to see how the world has changed in incredibly positive ways. And so often we look at the picture of where we are now and we don't realize where we were 30 years ago, which actually isn't very long in history and how much progress in the most positive ways have been made for women, for people who've felt outside, for people who hadn't gotten any access to education, healthcare. It's actually quite miraculous to me how much generational change is posit possible. I'm an example of it, but now I get to see it all across the world. You saw at the time 30 years ago, there's a story you wrote in your diary about a little boy who you invite to as a hotel guest, and that just really had an effect on you. What's the story behind that? To Eduardo, I really was quite idealistic in at that age, and, and I met this little boy who was a street kid, tough, but also sweet. He was a child, and I actually took him to my room to take a shower and a bath and get him cleaned up, and I got him clean clothes, and then I took him to the fancy hotel in Rio de Janeiro, and bought him a hamburger and french fries and a puppet. He was so happy and I was having so much fun with him. And then the manager came and essentially kicked him out of the hotel and asked me to leave too. And it was so shocking to me that I was a guest of the hotel. This was a, a little boy. What harm was he doing to anyone? And yet talk about being overlooked and unseen. It had a huge impact on me that we have this world where some people matter and some people are fundamentally left out. Would you say that that story was really prevailing in your mind when Tony Cristiano came and asked you to be his right-hand person? And you thought, there's so many of these leader boys out there that really need my help and I need to get out there. Sure, well, you know, it was part of it. Mm. I would say even more is that on the weekends, both outside of Santiago, Rio de Janeiro, Hong Kong, I would go into the quote unquote poorer parts of the city and I would see this colorful, vital human life working and creating. And I didn't see it from a place of pity. My own grandmother had a third grade education and worked in a sweatshop. So I was very proximate to these communities. And, and I just thought, why wouldn't the bank lend to these people so that they could solve their problems, change their lives? And that's what really had an impact on me. And in fact, I went to my boss to say, let me start a program so that I can lend here. Because at the time we were lending to very wealthy people, hundreds of millions of dollars, many of whom it didn't seem to me had a real seriousness about repaying the banks. Whereas instinctively I believed that we might get a, have a better chance of having people pay us back if we actually lent locally to people who hadn't had been given that opportunity. You were only 25 when you left what your dad considered the job of a lifetime. I imagine you must have prepped for that conversation with your parents. How did it go down? Well, <laughs> I don't think, I probably could have prepped a little more in hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> now my mother would say, you know, she didn't have a chance ever with me anyway, because I was going to do what I really believed. Yeah, but, you just um, thought you would never get married. <laughs> at the time, I mean, my mother's the enforcer in my yeah. household. And so she was definitely, you cannot go, you will never get married. My father felt I was giving up the job of a lifetime. It was, it was really hard. And I had been raised to be a good girl and not let, not disappoint my parents. Yeah. And so that I think was the hardest part that I was really letting them down. On the other hand, I knew that if I didn't go then at age 25, when I wasn't really, I was risking the future career, but I didn't have anything really. I knew that if I didn't go, I'd get on a track and I'd probably never go again. And you got on that plane, you cried on the And plane. I cried. <laughs> yeah, that in Cote d'Ivoire, you also ended up in Kenya. And I learned that you said you went to try the same continent and then you realized that they didn't want to say anything. Mm -mm. What's the story behind it? How did you learn that lesson? Oh, so painfully. Yeah. 
I didn't come with this, again, the sense of pity, but I did come with this great enthusiasm that there wasn't a problem we couldn't solve and that I really wanted to help do it. And I wasn't properly introduced. The women didn't understand who I was. Some of them were understandably threatened by a 25-year-old American girl who hardly spoke French and didn't really have an understanding of their culture. And now I see that there was this sense of how dare you. At the time, I just thought, but I'm here to quote unquote help. I don't ever use the word help anymore. I don't think we want to be helped or saved. I think we want to have partners who work with us, accompany us so that we can solve our own problems. Failure after failure after failure. You said before, I was born for crisis. It fits the fact that you stayed on regardless. What do you mean by that though, born for crisis? Maybe it's part of being the eldest of seven in a cowboy house where we had our share. <laughs> what I've learned about myself, and I have gone through many very, very difficult times and crises, in those moments, there's a part of me that just becomes sort of steely and everything goes away except for what is needed to solve the problem. A great calm comes over me when everybody else might be spinning. And I love solving problems. I think I'm also drawn to conflict areas, mm -hmm. war zones, maybe because that's where you see the, yes, the worst of human beings, but you also see the best of human beings. And it's at that extreme evidence of who we actually are as human beings, where I feel extremely alive mm -hmm. because you have to hold the spectrum. I would imagine you as a journalist, also understand that draw. Yes, for sure. There are so many amazing stories that come out that you normally wouldn't get if you just go, say, to an office every single day, nine to five, go home. Mm -mm. I mean, there is trouble there, but it's a very different kind of trouble and strife, for sure. That's right. And why are we on earth, if not to know each other, to be a part of each other's stories? I actually think that is what fundamentally makes us human. You were invited to Rwanda set up Duterimbre. I wonder what's the secret sauce behind that microfinance band that make it work? By the time I got to Rwanda, I had learned one of the most important lessons of my life from failure. And that was humility. Mm -hmm. That was, we so often come in as outsiders with answers. If you come in as a guest and start asking questions and listen, to other people and who they are and what they want first. And you do that long enough and you show up through thick and through thin, over time you'll be treated as a local. And I think that was the secret sauce, plus the fact that a very wise friend said, you are not spending the rest of your life here. And so if you wanna build an institution, it has to be Rwandan. And number one, you need co-founders and two, you can never take credit. You can share it but you can never take it. I am so grateful for that advice. Wouldn't you describe as maniacal and just going at lightning speed at a time? What would you like as a co-founder back then? First of all, I'm still described as maniacal by some people <laughs> and going all the time. Yeah. But it was a different kind of co-foundership. I worked with the first three women parliamentarians in the country, and so this was not their day job. However, without them, we wouldn't have had the legitimacy, the contacts, I wouldn't have had an understanding of how to navigate the larger status quo, society. And I could roll up my sleeves with two other women who were more at my level to get things done. And, oh, we had fun. But at one point, because I was such a lunatic in terms of how fast I moved, I got malaria. And Immaculate, one of the parliamentarians, came to my bed and said, well, now that you're finally sitting still, <laughs> There's something I need to tell you. You're going too fast. And we can't keep up with you. And I actually had a, a mentor at the time, a woman named Mary Rosales from the Philippines, who was amazing, probably 30 years older than I am. And I went to her in tears because I felt that I was failing again because I was moving so fast. And she said, let's problem solve this. How would we organize it so that progress could be made, but you could constantly be creating 
the power in other people. And so I would work in Kigali for two months. We'd work on all these work plans. And then I would work in the slums in Nairobi and across Kenya, working with women's groups for UNICEF, which is what Mary had overseen. And then I would come back. And sometimes we would have taken a few steps back. It didn't matter. Over time, became Rwandan. And now, if you walked in, nobody would even know who I was. I am. And that, to me, is success, that you, you work with people, you let them lead, and your footsteps disappear. Yeah. I wanted at this point to talk about Agnes. So Agnes is one of the co-founders. She co-creates a liberal party based on multi-tribal democracy. She was also an executive director, but then she later became one of the highest ranking planners in the Rwandan genocide. And I just wonder, I mean, did it make you question who you were working with and thinking, gosh, do I need to care about the monster inside of us? Some kind of safeguard to ensure we don't cross that line. The Rwandan genocide, that we changed, changed our understanding that never again, frankly, after the Cambodian genocide, was something that we have to continue to ward against. My personal interaction with it changed my understanding of what it means to be human fundamentally. Sitting across from Agnes in prison and thinking about this woman who had a freckled face and wearing a pink dress made me realize that It's too simple to try to separate the world into good people and bad people, angels and monsters. That angels and monsters live inside every single one of us and that our monsters are our broken parts, our shames, our grievances, our insecurities, our secrets. And that in times of insecurity, and I frankly feel we're living in one of those times right now, it becomes really easy for demagogic leaders to prey on those broken parts to blame others for our own problems and sometimes to make us do terrible things. And Agnes represented that more than any other human being because I watched her and people would say, would you have imagined that she would have helped lead a genocide? And I would always want to say, how many people do you work with on a daily basis that you think, oh, you could do that? That it's the unimaginable. And yet, In a world where success is defined by money, power, and fame, people start searching for power and choose power over purpose. And that's what ultimately leads us to do things that we shouldn't be doing. I want to talk about Acumen, obviously. First, Acumen CEO, Dan Tool, he once described how it was like building Acumen. He said, I feel like we're standing at the fifth block of brick building and we are putting brick by brick together without a safety net underneath. I wonder what was it like for him to say something like that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Dan came, Dan and I worked together in Rwanda. And so Dan was really, and is, he's still one of my closest friends, an emergencies guy coming out of the humanitarian perspective. And suddenly we were trying to change capitalism (laughs) in a way. And he'd say, we go into these meetings, Jacqueline, and people tell you you're crazy. And they're throwing all these terms at us that I don't even fully understand. And so we've never done this and the world has never done this. And you're just expecting me to lay the foundation, but we're 50 feet above the ground. And I was just like, Rome was built brick by brick. And he's like, I know, but I'm on the fifth floor. And that's what it felt like going into a meeting and trying to describe that markets overlook the poor too often, that top-down aid and government too often creates dependency and that what we needed was something in between that took the discipline of markets and the humanitarian ethos of what government's supposed to do. And people would be like, you obviously don't understand how business is done. And all we could do was take a step, see what we could prove, know that it might take us several years. But over time, if it worked and we didn't know for sure that it would, we might be able to help create an entirely new way of doing things. But We didn't have a roadmap. Was there a point where you thought, ooh, the tide is changing. People are starting to get it. There was a point when I thought the tide was changing. I was starting to get it. There were two points. One was we had made this investment in a malaria bed net factory in Tanzania. And the first time I went, of course, nothing was there. 
A year later, there were four machines and women working and they were producing these long lasting malaria bed nets that were saving people's lives. A year later, there were 10. A year later, there was a 70,000 square foot factory employing 13,000 women producing 30 million nets every year. And I thought, it's working, it's happening. The second was this idea of dignity. We made an investment in a company called D-Light doing solar light. And I went to visit a grandmom who had one of these lights. And by this point, I had been working in development for many years. And I had talked to many grannies who had been given grants, objects that, you know, here's your solar lamp. And they say, thank you very much. You're so wonderful. Maybe they feed you and you go away feeling good and nothing changes. And suddenly I was watching this tiny woman talking to the district a distributor and saying, let me tell you how you can improve this lamp. One, two, three, three different ways that you can improve this lamp. And I watched him listen to her and take her seriously. He wasn't standing there with a false sense of benevolence. She wasn't pandering. And in that interchange was the seeds of their mutual dignity. And that was the moment I literally got teary and thought, this is why I started Acumen. We need a different conversation that understands that when she gets dignity, he gets dignity. And I'm not just doing this so that low income people have access and choice and opportunity. When they do, then we have a world that we're proud to live in and it gets better for all of us. I would say those were two really critical moments. When the tide turned with the world was in suddenly, everybody was talking about impact investing. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. Now, they didn't all do it in the way that <laughs> Acura did it, but I think language often precedes change. We've mentioned Mike before, the crypto king, <laughs> or self-described Boris Gump of Bitcoin, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. I told you we laughed a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I thought what was interesting, so he said, the key is to make a lot of money and give it back to the world and you disagree. Have you managed to convince him otherwise? I would say we're still having the conversation. Mm. I'm so proud of my yeah. crazy, <laughs> alive, very human. Lots of parties. Parties, <laughs> mistakes, spectacular successes, sometimes yeah. all on the same day. You know, over the last years, I think in part because Mike has had public failures, he's gained deep empathy for people in the criminal justice system in the United States, which is so fundamentally broken. We live in one of the most violent societies and one of the most heavily incarcerated societies. And I'm so proud of the way that he has used his influence and his power to extend it to those who haven't had power or influence. N again, not in a ben falsely benevolent <laughs> way, but in a way that's really taking on the system. and. Through Mike, I've met just extraordinary men who've been in the prison system for 20 to 40 years and have come out better leaders than many of the leaders I know who have a fairly righteous sense of who they are in society. We can't talk about acumen without talking about Southeast Asia because you're now here in Malaysia. I wonder what is the story behind acumen coming to this part of the world? So Acumen, on the, and we do three things at Acumen, all focus on solving problems to build a, a world of dignity. Acumen Ventures, we invest in companies that are solving big problems of health, education, energy, agriculture. We invest for 10 to 15 years. We accompany those entrepreneurs. We measure what matters and when money comes back, we reinvest it. The second piece of Acumen Ventures is more traditional impact funds. And we'll soon have about a half a billion dollars under management. Those, in, those investments, as you said, have reached almost more than half a billion people. It works. Along the way, we learned though that two things. One, as you get closer to solving a problem, you will only solve it systemically if you partner. So we have Acumen Alliances. Mm. The third is that you also need not just talent, you need people who have moral leadership in the way that they are building. That's Acumen Academy. By moral leadership, I mean people who aren't leading like too many of our leaders do today, which is from a sense of, I can only be right if you are wrong. 
I can only win if you lose, the zero sum. Our world is too interdependent for a zero sum way of thinking and operating. And yet we're living in a moment of history where we're pulling away from each other within our countries and across countries. So for the first few years of Acumen Academy, we stayed in Acumen's more traditional footprint, South Asia, East West Africa, Latin America, the US. And then it became clear that Acumen Academy needed and wanted to be global. Kathleen Chu of YTL Foundation had been a supporter of Acumen. And importantly, I first met her without having any idea who she was, nor did she have any idea who I was. Wasn't it in a taxi on the way? It was in a taxi. And we talked and talked about her having seven children, me being the eldest of seven, growing up with Catholic background. It was all about values. It was about what we cared about. It wasn't about professions or status. It was about what real, what it means to be human in a different yes. kind of way. That started our relationship. And I believe all relationships are formed in those beginning moments based on those values. And so when we started looking outside, I talked to Kathleen and said, well, what do you think about South Asia? It makes so much sense for Acumen, not because we want to bring Acumen to Southeast Asia, but because There's so much innovation happening here because the world is tilting to the east and because you can't really have a global conversation without the wisdom of Asia and particularly Southeast Asia, which has so much focus on the collective, on a sense of responsibility, not only rights, on duty. And the world desperately needs that. All of our attentions are on your right, I'm wrong. We need a creative tension around the individual and community, around responsibility and rights. And so build, extend a community in ways that identify the new innovations, but also the old values and bring that into the larger global global community. And so we wouldn't be here without Kathleen, without Lam from Vietnam, without Stanley from Singapore, and those three who are members of the Asian Philanthropy Circle, they're the anchors. They're the entrepreneurial philanthropists who then worked with some long-term Acumen team members from the region to build from the bottom up. And I love learning and building and growing. And the last few days with 80 of the 110. And AVPN as well. (laughs) AVPN has been a great player too. I've also been there. I feel like we're part of this community that is global. And so to be here at AVPN and see Tharkurum, a Pakistani fellow who is fundamentally changing telehealth in Pakistan as this amazing woman doctor, or Shock, incredible Indian technology platform company that has moved a billion dollars into the lives of very, very poor people by giving them access to government services in conversation with fellows here. This is the dream. And Acumen's role can be to identify that innovation wherever it exists in the world and share it with the rest of the world. Take those Mm -hmm. insights, inspire a new generation that we truly can build a world that isn't focused solely on profit and the individual at the center of our systems but that insists on putting our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth there. There are some people, critics, who might say these social entrepreneurs, they will succeed regardless of whether Acumen is here or not. I wonder how you would answer that and what that actual value add is. Entrepreneurs who succeed have the determination to succeed and they will find a way. Mm. That's why I love social entrepreneurs. They see the world word impossible and they take it as a challenge. And so I think there's some truth to, I would have succeeded one way or another. Yeah, you wouldn't be doing this. If the door were two feet to my right, I'd probably knock down the brick wall, then find even find the door. The reason for Acumen is an acknowledgement that social entrepreneurs have a very lonely path. Taking on the status quo and trying to create new ways of doing things is by definition not easy. And it's particularly not easy when you're surrounded by 
a society that values success in much more traditional ways. And I would say I grew up in that same system. And so Acumen and Acumen Academy are here to provide that community, that sense of home, absolutely the right kind of capital, because we need that too. And hopefully we can model that. But the vision long term is that these social entrepreneurs become the role models and they're creating the business models for the future. And in 15 to 20 years, we'll be able to look across the world and see these Acumen Academy individuals leading major corporations, civil society organizations, ministries, maybe heads of state, but they will know their country. They will know how to have difficult conversations across race, class, ethnicity, religion, and they will know other countries and move away from this bifurcated vision of the world where innovation comes from one place, but rather will truly see each other as human beings in a singular human endeavor that understands that we will rise together or we will fall together. And I think that's what Acumen represents, but it's not like Acumen's coming to town. It's, there's a community that needs to be born and born again. And we're as strong as the individuals within the community are strong, particularly if everyone in it lives from that ethos that if we give more than we take, everything changes. Akima may not have come to town, but Jacqueline has come to town. I'm sure your team has spent a long time prepping for this. You must also have some kind of personal KPIs before you came. What were your goals coming here and did you achieve them? My goals coming here. So I often say that trust is the rarest and most precious currency we have. If you can imagine that Kathleen and Stanley and Lum built programs here in South Asia, Southeast Asia with our team fully online. And there was no acumen at the time. It's just amazing to me. And so this is the first time that all of the fellows had the opportunity to meet in person. And mm. I wasn't going to miss that. And the foundry coming together. The foundry coming together. And the foundry are those fellows who've gone through the immersive and now they're part of the acumen to immerse myself, feel it, see it. So the KPI was to acknowledge the work, immerse myself and understand the people here, the opportunity, so that we could dream a little bit together, to acknowledge and honor the anchors, YTL and Lam and his son, Jeremy Stanley, our team, who is just incredible when I think about what they built and how they built it, the fellows. And I can see now the cluster of fellows already working on mental health, working in food systems, working in energy, working with indigenous people. And I'll tell you, I wanna connect them to, oh, we have people working in food systems in Colombia and Los Angeles and in Northern Pakistan and in India, and they're part of your tribe too. And if we can start to pull these not just dreamers, but doers together with the values of the manifesto who really do focus on doing what's right, not what's easy. I truly believe you weave enough of this together and systems change. And young people see that there's a whole generation that is defining success in a way that can create a new kind of superhero so that that's what they want to grow up to be. Even if there still are a lot of forces say, success looks like money or fame. I think that this is an opportunity, we're in an inflection point, and that this is part of a new way of storytelling and a new, a new definition. I love the word immersion, and I've spoken to many people who've met you as well, and they will always say that your schedule is incredibly packed, but when she's in front of you, she's so focused, you feel like she really is present, she really knows you. And I can tell also when you were talking about meeting Kathleen, you jump straight to what really matters which resonates with other people I've interviewed who would say, when I was in Harvard executive program, they would say, you ask, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Three times. Who are you first time? This is what I do. By the time you get to third, it's what I care about, what drives me, my family. It feels as though you have that ability to just go straight to the third level, the deep level. How do you do it? My mom said as a little girl, I used to listen with my whole body. <laughs> so I don't know. 
my mentor, John Gardner, used to say, the key to life is to be interested, not interesting. I love people's stories. I want to know who human beings are. And maybe my parents did a good job teaching me to love the world. I really love it. And I want to know it. And I don't feel like I'm that important in it. What's important is I want to find the light in somebody else. And I actually think that somehow that culture has transcended through Acumen. When I talk to so many of the fellows from Acumen Foundry, they'll say, I'll say, but really, what is it that makes this community different? And it's really to your point. They'll say, in, in, in many other programs, you walk in and everybody starts posturing and say, well, these are the KPIs I've done, and this is what I've created. At Acumen, you sort of assume that's all being done. And you say, how's your health? How's your family? Are you sleeping? And they use the word home a lot. And for a while, I would think, oh my goodness, are we too soft? And what I've realized is, no, it's that their lives are so hard. Their work is so hard. Here's a place where they can talk about failures, where they can talk about vulnerabilities, where they can talk about how do you take on real change, even in places where it can be dangerous, when you're also trying to be a good mother. How do you balance that? Are you making your children pay a price for the work that you're doing? We need places to have those kinds of conversations so that human beings can take on the change that's needed in the world and do so in a way that actually embeds it and allows it to not only succeed, but sustain. And so I think that Acumen's secret sauce, if you will, is a fearlessness in marrying the head and the heart and the spirit and realizing that if all we're focused on is a hard head and KPIs that keep us distant from human beings, not only do our hearts become stone, but we can easily make humans turn into inputs. If all we are is heart, then we too easily end up doing a lot of nothing. And I actually think that's not loving at all. It's sort of pablum. It's almost disrespectful. I think I learned early on that it means we sometimes have low expectations for people. And we're really good as human beings at going down to low expectations. And so you need to hold the two. Hard head, soft heart, it's not comfortable. You have to walk into a room where the expectations are that you will look smart and professional and efficient. And we need to be all those things. But if you're working with people who assume that you actually don't care what their answers are because you already know what they need, you're going to fail. You have to walk into the room with very low income people who actually don't trust you, have seen people like you come and go to solve their problems and made things worse. And you have to learn how to build trust, create systems, fight a status quo, take on sometimes very tough mafias that would rather you not succeed and almost have more fitness, more intellect, more heart than it takes to just create a profitable business or just have a, a really good heart and do just more almsgiving. Yeah. It's all legitimate. But what I care about is fundamental change that allows people to find themselves and bring their best selves to the world. What I love is that it brings me perfect to the next point. You talked about marriage. You talked about expectations. Okay, now you're going to get me there. Yes, we have <laughs> to talk about Chris, your husband. He's the curator of tech conferences. I learned during my research, he spent four years chasing you, moved all the way to New York for a 2% chance of you saying yes. And I thought it was hilarious that he said, I'm really glad that you have a checklist of people because you're 40 and you clearly haven't succeeded. So I have a chance. I'm sure you must have thought very carefully about who your life partner has to be. How did you decide that? Yes, Chris is the one. <laughs> <laughs> you should probably ask Chris. <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> Okay, you really got me now. Well, first of all, the man is a risk taker and it's really hard to say no to him. And 
when he first asked me on a date and I said, absolutely not. And he said, do I have a 2% chance? And I said, absolutely not. And he said, you're supposed to be the humanitarian and you wouldn't give me a 2% chance. And I said, I'll give you 2%. It's still a joke in our family that, you know, 2% is better than zero, Jacqueline. As long as I have it, I'm going for it. I don't think I had this grand plan. I do think I was afraid that if I married somebody, there was a risk of expectations that I would get smaller somehow. And because I, I love family, I'm deeply grounded in community, and I had been committed my whole life to something much bigger than me. And I wasn't sure that there was a man who could hold both. When Chris came into my life like a just a thunderstorm, it took me a while to realize that he was never going to hold me back. And more than that, what he loved was that I was committed to something so much bigger than myself. And when we married, which granted, I gave him a really hard time when I finally married him, <laughs> he snuck in an extra vow and really surprised me. And he said, Jacqueline, there's one more vow. I promise never to hold you back. And there have been many times in our lives. Once when I called him after I was in a shootout in Pakistan and really shaken up. And he said, you know, are you okay? And I said, I'm, I'm good. And he said, do you want to come home? And I said, no, I want to stay with my team. And he said, I'm sort of torn because the protector in me wants to say, come home now. But the man who vowed to you that I would never hold you back has to do whatever you want to do. And I said, that's all I needed to know because now you're just with me. And so I have a life partner as well as a, a soulmate and a love. And I feel really lucky for that. Amazing. Any advice for people who are looking for a life partner who also have a mission that is bigger than themselves and might feel as though no one's going to add up? Well, this is what my mom may have gotten wrong all those years ago. <laughs> I think so often women especially start to feel the biological clock or family pressure and think, I've got to find my partner now and start holding themselves back because they want to create space to find that partner. I'm not sure we actually open ourselves up to the magic of the partner that might actually be the right one for us. What I have discovered through life is that when you are doing what you love, particularly with people you love, it makes you the most alive. And you're much more likely, even if you're working on the other side of the world, to find that life partner. And I think you will recognize yourselves in each other. And it's probably like everything, when you want something too much, we get all stressed out and that's when we miss it. But if what we want is to be fully engaged and alive in the work that we do, that's when we're beautiful. And it's why I often ask people in the interviews, tell me what you're doing when you feel most beautiful. Mm -hmm. Then I'm much more likely to be able to figure out in what job are you gonna thrive? And I think we need a better way of educating our children. We don't teach them in school how to have a good relationship, how to choose a good job, how to be financially literate. We teach them skills to be rich, powerful, and famous. We need people who are in the world, who love the world, and who realize that the more you give, the more you get. And that happens in love too. Jacqueline, it's been such a pleasure to have you. I always end with the same questions. The first is things, and I feel like I know the answer. Do you feel like you have found your why? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I want to build a world where every human being has dignity. What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? I never think about my legacy. Mm. But if there is an example of a person whose legacy I most admire. It's my mentor, John Gardner, who never aspired to have his name on the wall, nor a big title in front of his name, but who invested in everyone around him, particularly younger people, including me. And sometimes I look across the world and I meet young 
or people my age who've been influenced by him, and equally important Acumen fellows, young people around the world, and I hear them using John's very words that came through me, and I think, John, you're still here, and what better legacy is that? And what do you think are the most important qualities of a successful person? Curiosity, kindness, a focus on the amount of energy they release in other people, not just what they accumulate themselves. And where can people go to support you, support Acumen, find out what you're doing? Our website, which is www.acumen.org. And anything else you'd like to share that we haven't somehow covered? Two things. First, I sometimes look at this next generation and I understand how scary the world can feel. We talk about climate change. We see smoky cities and a lot of frightening things in the world. And sometimes people will say to me, what can I do? These problems are too big. And I would say, you can do a lot, but start with what you have, where you are. It could be a tiny step, take a step, and let that step teach you where you next need to go. The Jesuits say, go to where your deepest yearnings meets the world's greatest needs. You find that by living that. You find purpose by living it. Yeah. And the second thing is if there is one rule, it is not only do unto others as you would have them do unto you, yeah. but it is give more to the world than you take from it. If you're an investor, focus on what you're investing, not just what on you're extracting. If you're teaching, focus what is being let into the world and you'll find out how much you're being taught back. I think there's not a single profession, a single way of being in the world that couldn't do better if we use that fundamental idea and ultimately we find that others see it, they pay attention, and then they change. Fantastic. That's the perfect note to end this interview. Thank you so much for your time, Jacqueline. Thank you so much.